Ultraman came from Galaxy M78 with extraordinary powers to protect Earth. Ultraman is probably one of Japan's biggest icons. Godzilla, Pokemon, and the Power Rangers might be quite famous, but Ultraman follows right behind them. The story of Shin Hayata, who would turn into the giant being Ultraman to protect Earth from monsters, premiered in 1966. Since then, entire generations grew up with their eyes glued to the television screen, watching guys in suits tear apart miniature cities. There have been very many Ultramen since the series began. Over 50 years later, the franchise has expanded to multiple series, movies, and even an anime series on Netflix. With any icon that is financially successful, the owner must protect it at all costs. Subaraya Productions, the original creator of Ultraman, has been in a protracted legal battle for more than two decades. This battle has gone back and forth through the courts of various countries and through various appeals. It's a fascinating and complicated story, the tug of war for the rights to Ultraman, and also an interesting look behind the scenes of one of Japan's most famous media icons. Join me today as we take a look at the legal battle for Ultraman. series as is now known actually started with Ultra Q. Eiji Tsuburaya wanted to create an anthology series like The Twilight Zone, which was very popular at the time. Gradually more giant monsters were added in. The success of this series would lead to a new one, this time in color. In 1966, Ultraman premiered in Japan and was a success. The premise focused on the Science Patrol, an organization defending Earth from alien invasions and monsters. One of the members, Shin Hayata, would transform into the giant being Ultraman to fight off other monsters. The other members of the Science Patrol had no idea he was actually Ultraman for the entire show. The original show established many of the tropes for the franchise. It was a fun show where Ultraman would do battle with giant kaiju in glorious tokusatsu style. The monster designs were over the top, wacky, and interesting. And some were pretty much just spare suits they rented from Toho. Also, the Science Patrol had some nice jackets. Where can I get one of those? After the success of Ultraman, the show was followed up by Ultra 7 and then many other shows. The Ultra series, as it was now known, was very popular even outside Japan. Across Asia, the character became a pop culture icon. It was a great opportunity to branch out into other markets. In the mid-1970s, Subaraya Productions worked with a production company in Thailand called Chayo Productions. This production company was founded by a man who would play a central role in this story. Sompote Sangenduen Chai, whose name I'm probably mispronouncing, so here's what it probably should sound like. Sompote Sangduen Chai. Also known as Sompote Sans, is a Thai film director, born into a Thai Chinese family. As a child, he dreamt of being a filmmaker. He worked in a photo studio, and once took photos of the king of Thailand at the time, King Bumibol, for a popular youth magazine. He was also a photographer for the Thai newspaper Siem Rath. He would go on to found his own production company named Chayo Productions. His first film was the kaiju film Ta Tien, released in 1973. Inspired by the works of Toho and Tsuburaya and the kaiju genre, he directed the film and did special effects for it. The film was a hit in Thailand, eventually earning 3 million baht on a budget of 200,000 baht. The success of this film would allow Sampote to team up with one of the studios that inspired him, Subaraya Productions. In 1973, Subaraya Productions released the series Jumborg Ace, the story of a giant mech that fights giant monsters from space. It was very similar to their Ultra series in its style. Afterwards, they began collaborating with Chayo Productions to co-produce a film. In 1974, Jumborg Ace and Giant was released in Thailand. It featured Jumborg Ace and a character from Ta Tien, Yuk Wood Jieng, 
and they team up to face off against several foes of Jamborgues. Tsuburaya and Chayo would collaborate once again that same year, this time featuring Tsuburaya's most famous franchise, the Ultra Series. Yeah. Hanuman vs. Seven Ultraman premiered in Thailand in November of 1974 and was titled in Japan as the Six Ultra Brothers vs. the Monster Army. The story of the Hindu god Hanuman, who teams up with Ultraman and his uh. brethren against famous Ultra foes. The film is considered to be an Ultra mess. One review said, if people hate Godzilla vs. Megalon so much, the Six Ultra Brothers vs. the Monster Army makes it look like Oscar winning material. <gasps> Another review, this is that madness. As you watch the Six Ultra Brothers vs. the Monster Army, there is a constant feeling of something clawing at your mind and tearing out your nerve endings like weeds in a field. So the film wasn't very good, but it did help to cement the popularity of Ultraman in Thailand and the rest of Southeast Asia. Back in Japan, another tokusatsu franchise had grown in popularity. Airing first in 1971, the Kamen Rider series featured the motorcycle riding superhero with insect armor fighting the villainous Shocker organization. This series was similar to Ultraman's concept of a superhero with powers fighting against an advanced enemy. Seeing an opportunity, Child Productions approached the creators of Kamen Rider, Toy Company Limited, for a co-production. However, this time, Toy Company declined to work with them. So Chayo went and made their own Kamen Rider film without the permission of Toei. Hanuman and the Five Riders brought back Hanuman who, alongside the first five Kamen Riders, face off against King Dark. Half of the film is actually footage from the Kamen Rider film, Five Riders vs King Dark, while the rest was created by Chayo. This would be the beginning of questionable decisions by Sampote and his studio and would lead to major problems. In 1995, Noburu Tsuburaya, son of Iji Tsuburaya, passed away. One year later, Sampote presented a document supposedly signed by Noburu Tsuburaya in 1976, which gave Chayo Productions rights to the Ultra series worldwide, outside of Japan. Tsuburaya pushed back and said the document was a forgery. They pointed out several issues with it. For one thing, it was only one page. It also had several errors, including the name of Tsuburaya Productions. There were also errors with the names and episode numbers of the Ultraman series. As the legal battle ensued, Sampote claimed that Eiji Tsuburaya had based the design of Ultraman on Buddhist edifices in Thailand. Besides some photos from Sampote, there is no evidence to back up this claim. In 2004, a decision was made after years of battling in the courts. The decision granted Sampote and Chayo some merchandising and broadcast rights for the first six Ultraman series and Jamborgues. There were differing accounts in the Japanese press, in Thailand and in Asia over the extents of the rights they had gained. However, Tsuburaya would continue to pursue legal action. As Tsuburaya continued their legal battle, they did not market the first six Ultra series outside of Japan. They did distribute the series as created after Ultraman Taro, including the theatrical film Ultraman The Next. In 2005, American company BCI Home Entertainment gained the DVD rights to Ultraman through UM Corp Inc., who was working for Chayo. As this legal battle ensued, Chayo Productions began working on their very own Ultraman, Project Ultraman. Somehow they must have been feeling very confident about the situation. They created three different Ultraman, and they were used only for stage shows and merchandise. This project was to feature Hong Kong actor Ekin Cheng. These actions caused a return to the courts. August of 2006, Tsuburaya sued Chayo for copyright infringement because of their three Ultraman, and a case was opened in China. In 2007, the Thailand Intellectual Property Court ruled in favor of Tsuburaya, and in 2008, the Supreme Court of Thailand also ruled in their favor. At this point, Project Ultraman was dead in the water. Also, Chayo Productions was fined in both cases, and was due to pay Tsuburaya damages. However, in a twist of events, in 2009, both the Thailand Intellectual Property Court and the Tokyo District Court ruled in favor of Chayo. Now Tsuburaya was forced to pay damages to Chayo for violating their overseas rights to Ultraman. The legal battle was becoming quite complicated at this point, but there were even more crazy events coming. Chinese film studio Guangzhou Blue Arc produced the CG animated film Dragon Force. It was based on an original story by Kasuya Hatasawa, a veteran tokusatsu filmmaker. He directed the film along with Tommy Wong. So what should a studio do when they want their films to reach a wider audience? 
Just make an unauthorized film featuring Ultraman and your characters, of course. This seems to be an ongoing trend. Blue Arc gained the license to produce 3D animated Ultraman movies by UM Corporation and Taiga Entertainment. So in 2017, Blue Arc brought Dragon Force and Ultraman together in Dragon Force, So Long Ultraman. The animated film has the Dragon Force facing up against Ultraman, who is the villain in the film. If that wasn't already a huge slap in the face to the fans, during a press conference for the film, Blue Arc had a guy in shorts with a cheap mask and a terrible paint job. We've probably seen better Ultraman costumes at G-Fest. After the announcement of the film, it was back to the courts. November 2017, a Los Angeles court ruled in Subaraya's favor against Chayo and the other companies. The jury concluded that the document, Noburu Subaraya, allegedly signed with Chayo was fake. Chayo and UM Corporation tried to file a dispute, but on April 18, 2018, Judgment Day happened. The district court upheld the jury's decision and declared the document invalid. Thus, UMC and Chayo would no longer have any claims to international rights of Ultraman. Like any great saga, the story doesn't end there. Ignoring the final judgment of the court, Ruark went and made another Dragon Force Ultraman crossover. In January of 2019, they released a sequel film titled Dragon Force Rise of Ultraman. Internet users, especially those in China who knew about the rights dispute, roasted the film on social media. The film has a 3.2 out of 5 on the Duban movie review site. However, it did gross $5,755,461 at the Chinese box office. One last time in the court. Seems like we've been here a lot. December 10th, 2019, the US Court of Appeal for the Ninth Circuit upheld the previous court's verdict that Subaraya held the rights to Ultraman. They rejected UMC's appeal for a retrial. At this point, the case was shut, unless UMC was crazy enough to take this dispute to the United States Supreme Court. As ridiculous as it sounds, it would have been crazy if this case really went to the US Supreme Court, but that didn't happen. UMC was given a deadline to file an appeal to the US Supreme Court by March 4th, 2020. When they failed to do so, Subaraya declared victory. Also, UMC was ordered to pay 4 million US dollars in damages. Sompote came back into the spotlight in September of 2020, when the Thai Supreme Court ruled that Subaraya Productions were the legitimate rights holders to Ultraman and Jumborgase. They even went so far as to give Subaraya the rights to Hanuman vs. 7 Ultraman and Jumborgase and Giant. Needless to say, Sompote wasn't happy about it. And since the movies are considered national heritage items, he plans to appeal to the Ministry of Culture. It's pretty ironic. This legal battle has raged on since the 1990s. At this point, it seems to be over and Subaraya has won. One takeaway from this whole fiasco is that sometimes there is a place for copyright law. While this is a controversial topic on YouTube, and one that requires a more nuanced discussion, we can all agree that what Child Productions, UMC, and Blue Arc did was wrong. The fact that they wasted more than 20 years with this legal battle, and Subaraya had to go to court countless times. In fact, they tried their best to handle this in a nuanced way. Toho Studios, creators of Godzilla, are infamous for the protection of their beloved monster star. They will sue the pants off anybody that even remotely infringes on their copyright. They probably would have incinerated Chayo Productions, UMC, and Blue Arc with an atomic blast of litigation. Toho's lawyers don't fool around, they will find you. Subaraya Productions will probably now follow a similar path after all of this. I just really hope this video won't get blocked worldwide now because of all the Ultraman footage. Copyright law exists for a reason, to protect someone's work from being used or sold without their permission. It may be that giant corporations wield copyright law like a hammer and smash anything, even work that is protected like parody and criticism. However, the intentions behind copyright law are meant to protect creators. There is a larger conversation to be had about copyright law, how creators and corporations can protect their work but also allow room for parody, critique, and fan-made work. The whole conversation about transformative work has been raging for more than a decade. However, what Chayo and Blue Arc did wasn't parody, it wasn't critique, it wasn't fan-made work. They just took the character of Ultraman without permission and made their own movies. UMC sold Ultraman products without permission. That's not transformative work, it's just like selling bootlegs and selling pirated copies. And the story of Sampote Sands is also an interesting one. An individual who started out with a passion for filmmaking and would even work with one of the studios that inspired him. How sad is it that two decades later he chooses to claim the rights to their own creation? 
and then to sell it off without their permission. As mentioned with the unauthorized Common Rider film, Chayo Films was already making some questionable decisions in the 1970s. As a fan of tokusatsu films, especially the Godzilla franchise, and as a wannabe filmmaker, I find his story both interesting and tragic. The ultimate irony was that Tsuburaya were even granted the rights to the films he co-produced with them. The good news is that Tsuburaya now can release the original six Ultraman series worldwide. They've already pushed heavily to market Ultraman in overseas markets. With the release of the Ultraman anime on Netflix, and another season on the way, this has helped to reach new audiences. Also, the ongoing Marvel Ultraman comics help to introduce new readers to the franchise. And one can't forget about the upcoming Shin Ultraman film still in production. After decades of legal battles, the future is looking bright for Super Aya Productions and Ultraman. This is a new series I wanted to try out, so please let me know in the comments what you thought of it. There's many more Goji files I want to go into and unravel for you guys. Also, what are your thoughts on this whole Ultraman legal battle? I'd love to hear from you all. If you want to see more videos like this, then please like and subscribe. That really helps the channel a lot. Until the next video, guys. Bye-bye.